All right, welcome back to our fourth and final video discussing portfolio optimization. Uh, so in the previous videos, we talked about the statistics that we need to know, and we introduced modern portfolio theory. In this video, I'm going to discuss the second and final part of modern portfolio theory, the asset allocation step. So I'll start off talking about utility and utility functions. And then I'll talk about risk aversion. These two concepts, they'll go hand in hand, and you'll see why immediately in this video. Then we'll walk through the asset allocation step. And then just to hammer home this entire process for modern portfolio theory, I'll optimize a three asset portfolio containing two stocks and a T-bill. So let's get started. So I have a question that I like to give to illustrate the concept of risk aversion and utility. If I asked you to choose which asset you would invest in, uh, which one would you prefer? We have a distressed stock with a high expected return. We have a large cap stock with a, with a significantly lower return. The downside here is that the distressed stock has a high volatility, high risk. So ultimately, each of these assets comes with uh, different returns and different risks. And, you know, they all have the same sharp ratio. So which would you prefer? Now, the answer to what stock or what bond you would prefer in this case is really dependent on you. There is no right answer here. What your choice reveals about you is your level of risk aversion. In other words, if you were a very risk averse investor, chances are you'd probably say you want to invest in a large cap stock, uh, you know, it has low return, but it also has very low risk. Uh, if you're not risk averse, if you're someone like me, uh, you might be more inclined to invest in the distress stock, take a bit of a, a gamble here. Uh, the downside here has got a lot of risk but it still has the same risk adjusted return, the same sharp ratio as the other assets. Ultimately, these assets have the same risk adjusted return. And so uh, your choice is dependent on your level of risk aversion. Very risk averse people would, they might even prefer the 10 year T-bond because it has no risk. Uh, this is this risk aversion concept is very important when we determine exactly where we put our money. Do we put it in T-bills? Do we put it in stocks? Ultimately, that answer is going to depend on your coefficient of risk aversion. Okay, so what are we talking about here? Well, uh, before I talk about the coefficient of risk aversion, I need to introduce or hopefully refresh your memory on utility. So from your economics class, or classes, hopefully you remember the concept of utility. It's just the benefit that you derive from an activity or an asset. It's not necessarily the amount of money you get. It's just the overall benefit uh, that is very, very hard to quantify. Uh, so typically, if you get a higher return on some asset, that's going to increase your utility. If there's a lot of risk associated with that asset that's going to decrease your utility because maybe you're worrying about it and you know you know worrying is bad uh, so ultimately when we talk about utility in investments what we try to do is build a utility function that essentially measures your utility there's all kinds of these utility functions out there in the real world uh, the one that you're seeing right now is the one that is advocated for by the CFA Institute what it says is that your ex your utility, your overall utility from investing is equal to your expected return on your investments minus one half times your coefficient of risk aversion times the variance of your portfolio. Uh, so the higher your return, the more utility you get, the greater your risk proxied by the variance here, the more the the less utility you get because you know worrying again is bad and then your coefficient of risk aversion plays in here because the more risk averse you are the less likely you would want to take risk so this coefficient of risk aversion the higher it is the more amplified this negative effect is from taking risk and this utility function this is i mean this is one of the ways that we determine the ideal weight 
that you assign to a risk-free asset and your risky portfolio. All right, so let's talk about risk aversion. When we talk about risk aversion, uh, basically this is a very important concept that's have, going to have a dramatic impact on the utility that you derive from some assets or, or a portfolio. Uh, typically we're going to measure it using questionnaires or even just talking to people and trying to get a sense of how risk averse they are. Uh, unfortunately, there is no perfect measure of risk aversion. And so this is why in the real world, we don't tend to use this, the second step of the modern portfolio theory, the asset allocation step. You know, we can try, but our, our estimates for the ideal weights based on a utility function are are very likely to be inaccurate. Uh, now we do have some other definitions that go along with risk aversion. Uh, the first one here is risk neutral or risk indifferent. Uh, I think some textbooks call it risk indifferent, but in the real world, everybody just calls this risk neutral. So this is the concept. This is the definition that you should know. Uh, now risk neutral means that you are completely indifferent with respect to the amount of risk that you are taking. The only thing that matters is the risk adjusted return that you get from a portfolio. So in that initial uh, example that I gave you, a risk neutral investor would be completely indifferent between the three stock portfolios. Why? Because they have the same sharp ratio. Now, most people in the real world, including myself, are risk averse, meaning that we uh, we are going to require greater return in exchange for taking greater risk. If I'm going to invest in, say, some penny stock or something like that, not that I ever would, uh, I'm going to need to have a, a, an incredibly high expected return for taking on that level of risk. Uh, if I'm investing in, I don't know, the S&P 500 ETF, that's got significantly lower risk. So I could demand a much lower return in exchange for investing in that. Uh, again, I need to harp on most investors in the real world, including almost every client you will ever meet, are going to be risk averse. The final definition we have here is risk seeking. And risk seeking investors, uh, these are investors who actually get some value out of taking risk. These are the thrill seekers. These are the people that go to uh, the, ra the racing track and bet on the horse with the longest odds not because it's got a higher expected return on the investment, but rather because they get some thrill out of taking that risk. The, the risk itself has value. Uh, really the only time we see risk seeking it behavior is at, you know, like a, a horse track or entering the lottery, for example, would be another good example where people, they're, you know, they get some significant benefit out of taking risk. Why? Well, maybe they enjoy thinking about all the possibilities that they could uh, execute if they were to win the lottery or that, that horse race, you know, or the bet that they had on the horse race. Uh, most investors, though, are risk averse. Okay, so how do we use utility functions? Well, utility functions allow us to plot what you're seeing right now. Uh, what you're looking at is just our mean variance frontier in blue here from the last video. And then I've plotted what we call indifference curves. And indifference curves, uh, basically these are plottings of every point where a person has the exact same utility. So say this point right here with a portfolio return of 14% and volatility of 40%, uh, this person would get a utility of 0.06, but they would also get that same utility if they had a portfolio that offered an 8% return and a 20% volatility. So these just tell us uh, how much utility that you derive. And you always want to get as close to the top left here as you possibly can. That indicates more utility based on our utility curves. Or, or sorry, in uh, indifference curves. Uh, now, the best that we can do is someplace on this mean variance frontier. This represents all the combinations that we can get 
for holding our stock portfolio or a risky asset portfolio. Uh, generally, we're going to want to choose the optimal risky portfolio because that's going to you know, give us the highest sharp ratio. Now, what happens if we can invest in a risk-free asset? Well, just like our last video, uh, if we can invest in the risk-free asset, then we can actually reach any point on our capital market line. Uh, so just to refresh your memory, the risk-free asset is the asset that has some generally positive return and zero risk. That's why it's risk-free. So this would be something like what we get for a T-bill. You know, you invest in a T-bill and you get a, let's say, a two, let's say a two and a half percent return and it's got no risk. You could also invest in some risky stock portfolio and that's represented out here in our mean variance frontier. Uh, now this capital market line represents every point that we can reach uh, represented by some weight to our risk-free asset and our risky portfolio. So right here is where we invest all of our wealth in our risky portfolio of stocks and other risky assets. And right here is where we invest everything we own in T-bills. Uh, here would be where we invest 50% in T-bills, 50% in risky stocks. So what I'm trying to get at is if we can invest in some risk-free asset, we can reach every point on this line. The points out here occur when we short T-bills and invest that cash in more stocks. Now, how do we determine the ideal weight for our portfolio? Uh, you know, the ideal weight that we assign to the risky stock portfolio and the risk-free asset. Well, we had this utility function that I introduced a few minutes ago. That utility function, when I use basic calculus, allows me to derive this formula. What it says is that the ideal weight that we assign to our risky portfolio versus the risk-free portfolio, or the risk-free asset, is equal to the return on our risky portfolio minus the risk-free rate divided by our coefficient of risk aversion times our variance that we assign to our risky portfolio. Uh, so basically, this tells us how much we should invest in stocks, and then one minus this is the weight that we assign to our risk-free uh, combination of T-bills. So this is how we use the asset allocation step. So that's that. Okay, let me just show you from start to finish the entirety of the, the modern portfolio theory. So the first step of modern portfolio theory we start off by uh, building the mean variance frontier. And this is just a plotting of all the portfolios that we could build with different weights assigned to the different stocks or other risky assets. Next, we assume that we can invest in a risk-free asset. Let's call it a T-bill. And that means that we can, I, we can reach any point on this capital market line in red. Next, we identify our utility function and our coefficient of risk aversion, and we want to reach the indifference curve that has the highest utility. And that's going to be the point that runs tangent to our capital market line. So it's probably going to be this thing right here, this utility function with utility of 0.05. And there it is. Uh, what this says is that the ideal weight that we assign to our risk-free asset versus our risky portfolio is going to be somewhere right here. This might represent the case where we invest, oh, let's say 75% of our portfolio in the in stocks and risky bonds and 25% in the risk-free asset called, let's call it a T-bill. So that, in a nutshell, is... Uh, it's essentially modern portfolio theory, both parts. Step one, security selection, where we identify the ideal risky portfolio. Step two, identify the weight that we assign to that risky portfolio versus a risk-free asset. All right, so let's put this into practice. So I have this example that I like to give uh, where we have two risky assets, Berkshire Hathaway stock, BRKA, 
and a gold ETF, uh, ticker symbol GLD. You can also purchase as much as you want of one-year T-bills. Let's say we know our utility function and we've, uh, you know, undertaken surveys and we believe our coefficient of risk aversion is three. Uh, so first off, we're going to identify the ideal weights of the stocks in our portfolio. And then we're going to identify the ideal allocation to the risky stock portfolio versus the risk-free asset. So let's move over to Excel. Okay, so I'm over here in Excel and we've got our example. We have our coefficient of risk aversion. And to solve this question, we're going to need to know three things. The expected returns on all of our assets, the standard deviations of our assets. Uh, notice I don't have a T-bill here because the T-bill uh, standard deviation is zero. And then we're going to need to know the correlations or covariances between our risky assets. Uh, again, correlation between these assets and the T-bill should be zero. Uh, so, uh, you know, I've given us all of this information. And what we're going to do is we're going to optimize this three asset portfolio containing the T-bill, Berkshire, and the gold uh, ETF. Now, let's start off with the security selection step. First things first, we need to identify the optimal sharp ratio. We essentially need to maximize our sharp ratio. But to get our sharp ratio, we need to calculate the risky portfolio mean and the variance and ultimately the standard deviation, which is just the square root of the variance. So let's get started. So our risky portfolio mean with these starting weights, let's just say our current weights of this portfolio are 50%, 50% in each of the risky assets. Uh, our mean is going to be just the expected return of Berkshire times the weight of Berkshire plus the expected return of the gold ETF times the weight of the gold ETF. All right, so that's that. Very easy 10% return. That'll change as we adjust these weights. You'll see why we have the weights in here and this, this sum uh, in a second. Next, we need to calculate the risky portfolio variance or standard deviation. Uh, generally, I mean, I guess we only need the standard deviation, but I'm going to go ahead and just do the variance here and take the square root in the cell below. Okay, so our risky portfolio variance is just everything inside this equation. This is our, well, it's our, our standard deviation of a two asset portfolio. So here, I'll, I'll just, I'll just do it right here. So equals square root of the weight of asset one squared times the standard deviation of stock one squared plus the weight of stock two squared times the standard deviation of stock two squared plus two times the weight of stock one times the weight of stock two times, well, in this case, I've got the correlation and the covariance. Uh, I'll just go ahead and use the covariance here because it's correlation times standard deviation times standard deviation. So I'll just close my parentheses and there we go. If we want to know the variance, we can just take this square. So there, okay, there's that. Okay, so now we have our standard deviation and our mean, and I'll zoom out here and let's get our sharp ratio. So our sharp ratio is just the risk adjusted return. It's just the risky portfolio mean minus our expected return on the T-bill. And we'll divide this by our standard deviation. And there we go. All right, now we've got our sharp ratio, but notice here if I were to take, let's say we've got our weights of 50 and 50. Let's say I were to put everything into uh, Berkshire. So I do 100% and 0%. Uh, my sharp ratio changes. If I reverse this and go 0% and 100%, uh, my sharp ratio changes again. Uh, basically, we want to find the maximum sharp ratio we can possibly find. Uh, so to do that, uh, we could tr we could do trial and error. We could certainly do that. But the easier thing to do is just have the 
computer tell us what the maximum sharp ratio is given a set of constraints. And to do that, I'm going to use solver. So to get solver, uh, basically I go up to the data tab, go over to the solver button and solver allows me to set an objective like maximize the sharp ratio, which I'm going to do. Make sure that I've got this set to max. My changing cells are the weights and I need to identify those cells. And then if I were to click solve right now, what you'd see is that these weights just blow up. I mean, they go into the, you know, 100 million and 500 million, something like that. What I need to do is tell the computer that we want these weights to sum to one. Uh, I, I know I opened it up a few seconds ago, but this cell right here, cell C16, is just the sum of our weights. It just says sum these cells. So I'm going to tell Solver, I want this cell, the total cell, to always be equal to one. So I'll add a constraint and say, I want this cell to equal one. And now when I click Solve, Solver found a solution. All constraints and optimality conditions are satisfied. All right, so. Uh, we were not far off by doing equal weighting. Essentially, the weights that maximize our sharp ratio for our risky portfolio are about 50.3% and 49.7%. So that's that. Step one of the modern portfolio theory is done. Everything else is just kind of formulaic. So to get our weight of the risky portfolio, uh, this is where we go back to that formula that I had on our lecture slides. So it just says the weight to the risky portfolio is equal to the return on that portfolio minus the risk-free rate, uh, all divided by our coefficient of risk aversion times the uh, variance of our risky portfolio. So here, I'll just take our portfolio mean, subtract the expected return on the T-bill, and divide that by our coefficient of risk aversion times our variance of our portfolio. And there we go. So I'll do that. And then I'll identify our weight to the risk-free asset, which is uh, you know, one minus that. So what this tells me is that the ideal weight that we assign to our risky portfolio that maxis maximizes our utility is 13.92%. That's the amount that we invest in, uh, or the, the amount of our overall wealth that we invest in Berkshire Hathaway and the gold ETF total. And then the remainder we put in a T-bill. And I, I guess these weights make sense because a coefficient of risk aversion of three is fairly risk averse and our T-bill yield is quite high relative to our stock returns. Uh, so with that, I'm going to conclude and let's summarize. So we talked about utility functions and we use utility functions in the second step of MPT to optimize our risky portfolio weights and the weight to our risk-free asset. I also introduced the concept of the coefficient of risk aversion. Uh, that's just our individual measure that we, we use surveys or direct conversation or observation to assign. It's very difficult to assign, which is why most uh, investors don't try to measure it. Uh, we talked about the optimal risky portfolio. That's the portfolio with the highest sharp ratio. We also identified the ideal portfolio combination graphically. And I showed you that, uh, that ideal portfolio combination has the, it lies on the tangency point with the capital market line. And then to optimize our portfolio, we typically don't do this by hand. What we like to do is use Excel or Python or R or some other package that does this uh, and ident identifies the ideal weights. So with that, I'm going to bring this video to an end. And if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. Thank you.